Hello, this is a short explanation of the realist view of sociological methodologies. Um, we first got to start with um, the division between positivism and interpretivism. So, if we look at what we have here, we have the concept with positivism that uh, sociology should be scientific in following the sciences. Which means objectivity is important. Which means that the personal values of the researcher should not affect research. And this is known as value freedom. The positivists such as uh, Durkheim argue that it is possible to be objective in studying social life because we can use quantitative data. We can gather information about human behaviour on a large scale and because it's on a large scale we're likely to be able to identify large scale patterns and trends, lots of people's behaviour and how it changes over time, trends, and that will tell us about processes and it will also tell us about social forces, the impact, the impact of social forces. Social forces such as integration. So in the case of suicide, which was studied by Durkheim, we say that the patterns of suicide on a large scale show that certain groups of people commit suicide more often than others. People with a less rigid faith, such as Protestants, are more likely to commit suicide because they are less integrated into the culture of society. They are less attached to and bonded to the norms and values of society which say you should not commit self-slaughter or kill yourself. Whereas those with a more rigid faith which tells them for example that you will be cast down into hell if you commit suicide are more closely attached to the norms and values of society which say human life is sacred. It was created by God and you don't have the right as a human being to take God's creations away. And so that would be the case for Catholics and Muslims, which would mean they are less likely to commit suicide. So Durkheim gathered information about suicide. And then from, this, from his findings about suicide, he developed the theory of social integration. Now there is a, a key point here if we compare positivism um, with the critical points made by some other theorists such as Popper. Durkheim argues for what we call an inductive approach. His reasoning is that from specific findings about suicide, he could develop a general theory about social behaviour. And then he could develop laws which would enable him to make predictions. So from the finding that Protestants are more likely to commit suicide than Catholics, the finding that married people are less likely to commit suicide compared to single people and childless people are more likely to commit suicide than those with children. His argument was that from these specific findings he could develop a general theory which would enable him to predict the behaviour of human beings. This is partly based on the fact that quantitative data is higher in reliability.
However, Popper criticised this view. Nineteen fifty nine, whereas Durkheim was in the nineteenth century presenting his argument. Popper argued that science cannot be truly objective. There is always a chance that a theory can be disproven or falsified. So his argument was for deductive reasoning. So he argued that science would be better if you had a specific theory or general theory, a wider idea. And then the aim of, or the goal, the aim of scientists is to attempt to try to disprove these ideas. So the goal of science is to try and achieve the refutation of ideas. That means you refute the ideas. So there's several arguments within positivism. So the positivist idea is generally that you can find out about the external world outside the human being. And the sociologist is able to find out about how society shapes the behaviour of the individual. So positivists such as Durkheim argue that you can find out about this world that pre-exists the human being. It existed as a system in terms of a gender system, a family system, status system. That existed before the human being was born and it will exist after the human being has died. Hi, Tan. Hi, Mace. So the positivist idea is that social forces such as the system around a human being are external to the human being and they shape behaviour. <clears throat> the argument was that this, these external social forces which operate and determine human behaviour can be detected if we find um, reliable patterns of, of data. However, the interpretivists have a very different view, so sometimes described as anti-positivism because they disagree with positivists. They state that sociology cannot be objective. So they argue that it's not possible to study social behaviour in a way that is without bias. It's not possible to study human behaviour in a way that is not influenced by values. And so values will always influence research. So research will always be value laden and it cannot be value free. There are different arguments within this explanation. So one of the arguments is that the reason why it can't be value free is because it's subjective. It's always influenced by the subjectivity of the individual. In other words, the definitions, how they define behaviour, identity, good, bad, different groups of people, and meanings. What they identify as meaningful and important, what they consider to be the meaning of behaviour or identity. So this is important. An example, the key example for interpretivism in looking at suicide is Atkinson's view. So in looking at suicide, Atkinson was very critical of the point of view of suicide. Atkinson said that suicide, the suicide rate itself, so the statistics on suicide, which Durkheim said were social facts, which means that they had been tested or found measured reliably, and so they were facts. Atkinson said they were socially constructed. So all data is socially constructed. All data is a result of a series of negotiations between human beings whose definitions and meanings within their mind shape behaviour. So it's to do with how people view things. And so their view of society is that human beings create society through their individual definitions, 
meanings, the way they interact with each other, how they label each other, and the symbols they use to communicate with each other, which could involve what you wear, such as a headscarf. It could involve the language you use to indicate whether you like or dislike others, whether you're happy or sad. And so these are all shaped by the internal thoughts of the individual, the mind of the person. So sociological researchers are just the same. They, they can't expect to be objective. They will always be subjective. In terms of realism, then, what is their solution to this debate? So we've had the structure view, which would include functionalists. So the structure views include functionalism, Marxism, and those theories, especially functionalists, adopt the view that it's possible to be scientific in studying social life, so positivism. The action theories, or social action views, involve interactionism and phenomenology. These theories tend to deny that it's possible to study social life objectively and that you're always going to be subjective. So they use different types of data. The positivists are interested in quantitative data, numbers and figures and statistics. The social action theorists are interested in qualitative data, descriptive information, often in the form of words. So it describes, and it often describes, feelings, meanings, definitions, why, whereas the quantitative data probably says what. How many? So realists actually will use both types of data. The realists believe that it is possible to, firstly, argue that sociology is science, a science or scientific. They say this because they argue that science itself is not completely objective and also tends to make claims about processes which cannot be observed. Since the social action theories argue that you cannot observe meanings, and so there will always be non-observable processes which shape data, and all you can do is find out about those meanings, you can't find out about facts objectively. And the functionalists, the positivists, would say they're observable processes, social facts, behaviour. The realists, the realists argue that science itself and scientists, even in the natural sciences, do not always make claims about processes which they can observe. They do make claims in natural sciences about processes and facts which cannot be observable and which are non-observable. For example, in seismology, where we study the movements of the Earth's crust and we try to predict earthquakes, scientists are unable to make precise predictions about when earthquakes will take place. In meteorology, the study of the weather, precipitation, rain, they're unable to make precise predictions about the weather. They can't precisely predict storms and other weather conditions. And so science itself cannot make objective claims about processes that can be directly observed. Some sciences deal with things that cannot be directly observed. Subatomic particles, as soon as they're looked at, will change, move, and so you cannot study them by looking at them directly. 
Continental Drift. Content of the British Isles used to be part of a huge supercontinent called Pangaea. It takes place over so many thousands and millions of years that we can't observe the process directly. So there's two views. There's Sayer's view. So Sayer is pointing out that sciences have closed systems which, in which the variables can be measured and controlled, like in a laboratory. But in many sciences, like meteorology, seismology, these are open systems. In other words, in nature, you can't control all the variables. And it's not possible to observe them all. So you can't make precise predictions. Keat and Uri nineteen eighty two so that sciences deal with things that cannot be directly observed like continental drift in the case of continental drift it takes place over such a long period that it's an underlying process which cannot be directly observed so let's look at this and apply this to sociology how is this relevant so if we look at sex crimes we might say that there are observable features or processes, but there is also non-observable processes going on with sex crimes. If we look at systems of class, we could look at the fact that someone who commits a sex crime comes from a particular class location. That might be a feature that we can directly observe about the nature of the offender, their, their social background. But the non-observable features might be to do with their attitudes towards women. That might be something that's harder to directly observe. If men see women as objects, and if their role is purely to provide pleasure for men, then that might be something that's more difficult to observe. There's also the underlying process of the objectification of women. Women come to be seen as sex objects. And that could be a result of the media representation or portrayal of women. Rather than having personality, rather than being people, they're seen as objects purely for men's pleasure, to look at and to use. If this is the case, this could result in the internalisation process, where men come to internalise or absorb the idea that women are sex objects. This becomes part of how they see the world. It becomes natural to them to think of women as sex objects. Now, this process may take place over many years. It may be difficult to observe it directly, but it may be an underlying cause of sex crimes or a factor that contributes to this. So in looking at the observable and the non-observable, we could use different types of data. We could use data which fits in with quantitative methods. And we could use data that fits in with qualitative methods. So we could use interviews to ask people why, what do they think about men and women. And we could observe the behaviour of people, how they really behave. So realists say we need a combination of this type of data of these types, so they recommend mixed methods. We can also use some other terms, methodological pluralism. Methodological pluralism is the idea that all methods are different and they're against the idea of a hierarchy. There's no superior or inferior, better or worse methods, just different depending on the type of topic studied and the interests of the researcher and this is called fitness for purpose where the researcher chooses a method that suits their aims rather than being guided by a particular theory or theoretical position in relation to methods so rather than thinking from a positivist or an interpretivist position we're just thinking in a pragmatic way 
So this is called pragmatic approach. So whatever is practical for our needs. If it suits us to do questionnaires and it's going to enable us to find out how many sex offenders there are in a certain group, then that will fit our aim and it's practical and it suits our purpose. Triangulation is also an issue with mixed methods where you can improve the validity and you can improve the reliability of research and data. With triangulation you can get information from unstructured interviews which tells you about things that are more difficult to observe like attitudes towards women. You could find out about how people really behave by asking them to complete a time diary to see how they behave in reality. And you could also do some observation. Participant observation would mean that you're spending time with your group to see how they behave towards women in reality. With this, you're doing triangulation, you're combining all the data together and pooling it, you're pooling the data, and this enables you to cross-check and compare. So look across at each type of data, compare the findings, and find out whether in reality people behave as they say they do in the each type of measure. So this will improve validity and reliability because you're checking findings, you're seeing if they can be replicated, and this also enables you to find out more depth from the methods because with the unstructured interviews and the participant observations you'll be getting more qualitative information and therefore you'd also be able to improve the accuracy of the measure in that way. So overall realists have a different view of science they claim that sociology can be scientific by combining methods we can improve our overall picture of reality and we can improve by not considering some measures better than others. There's also the concept of reflexivity where realists try to be self-consciously aware. of the possible impact of their values upon the research process. So this is where they're trying to avoid bias, where their values are imposed upon research, which would be called researcher imposition. So they're trying to avoid researcher imposition. So that's reflexivity, self-conscious awareness. That affects people in many areas of life, especially in identity where in a postmodern world people are continuously reassessing who they are in relation to their choices and making decisions about who they want to be from one moment to the next. Well, I hope you found this explanation useful. Obviously you can go back over it and, and look at any areas where you need further explanation. Um, it will also be worth looking at the um, Harry Lambus explanation of this, which is on page 929 of Harry Lambus Themes and Perspectives, Sociology. And it's also in the small condensed handbook on page 206. Thank you.